Hume, Majority Leader. Uh, Mr. Speaker, before we proceed, I would like to move for the reconsideration of my earlier motion, duly approved, for the referral of the speech of the Honorable Asadilio to the Committee on Rules. The reason for this, Mr. Speaker, is that many of our colleagues do want to, to interpolate. But uh, today, in as much as we do want to accommodate our colleagues, Mr. Speaker, we, we don't have the time because we are set to take up, uh, we, we are set to, uh, to proceed with the consideration of the uh, bill on charter change, Mr. Speaker. So without, I so move. Without objection, the motion for reconsideration is uh, granted and the referral to the Committee on Rules is recalled. Uh, with that, Mr. Speaker, I move for the suspension of the uh, consideration or the interpolation of the privileged speech of the Honorable Asadilio. Without objection, the interpolation of the gentleman from uh, Partidist Magdalo is suspended. Our status, Mr. Speaker, is that we have four minutes, we have five minutes. Uh, in the privileged hour, and we are committed to give time to the Honorable Rene Lampagos. He will be our last speaker, Mr. Speaker, and he will need about uh, 10 to 15 minutes for his speech, and after that, we can proceed to take up the bill on charter change. With that, I, I move that upon the expiration of the one hour for the privileged hour, we extend for another 10 minutes for the speech of the Honorable Rene Lampagos, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Rene Relampagos is recognized to deliver his uh, privileged speech and that the time is extended for another 10 minutes. You have the floor, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Majority for Leader. My distinguished colleagues, it has been all over the news since last week, the death of seven students during the field trip to Madlum Cave in San Miguel, Bulacan. News accounts have been consistent, Mr. Speaker, my honorable colleagues of this August chamber. A group of Bulacan State University students conducted a field trip to Madlum Cave in San Miguel, Bulacan on Tuesday August 19, 2014. Tragedy struck when heavy rains swelled the Madlum River and triggered a flash flood that swept students who were crossing the river, drowning seven students. The tour consisted of around 180 students, three teachers, and 10 tourist guides. The victims are first-year tourism students, Michael Alcantara, Sean Rodney Alejo, Michelle Ann Rose Bonso, Helena Marcelo, Madel Navarro, Jeanette Rivera, and Michael Bartolome. According to initial reports, there was no Commission on Higher Education approval to this field trip. Investigation is currently underway to determine criminal, civil, and administrative liabilities of the Bulacan State University. Madlum is located in the northern part of the Biak Nabato National Park. Madlum Cave is a prominent feature in the Angat Limestone Formation, which occupies most of the whole reservation of Biak Nabato National Park. To get to the cave, tourists have to cross the Madlum River. The caves, as well as the Madlum River, are a UNESCO World Heritage Site and a popular eco-tourism site. And according to the Manila Standard, the place is among the popular spots for bouldering and river trekking for mountaineering clubs and other extreme outdoor adventure groups. I would like to emphasize the word extreme outdoor adventure. I could not feel but sad and furious 
to the senseless loss of lives. To the families of the victims, my sincerest condolences. However, the Madlum Cave field trip is only one of the many instances where unfortunate incidents during these educational activities happen. To cite a few examples, just a year ago, we were also shocked by the news of death of three tourism students, two teachers, one reliever driver, and one tour guide during the Manila Ilocos Baguio educational tour of the Marinduque State College. They were on their way back to Manila on February 21, 2013, and at 10.30 in the morning when their bus collided with a container truck and then with another passenger truck bound for Binguet. The remaining 28 students who joined the tour were also injured while a CHED approved education tour, the bus was clearly over speeding according to police reports. Worse, the bus used by the school still lacked the nod of the land franchising and regulatory board to operate as a tour bus company. Their application having been filed only on February 12th or just six days before the scheduled tour on February 18. In short, Mr. P Speaker, it was a Colorum tourist bus. Earlier of the same month of February 2013, two high school students, ages 14 and 15, died when their tourist bus left running, rolled downhill, running over the two minors. The school involved was Holy Spirit Academy in Malolos, Bulacan, a private school. This incident happened in Tanay Rizal after the students visited Camp Kapinpin. Not far from my province of Bohol is the incident of the educational tour of the Cebu International School in Bataan during their Philippine Week celebration in 2012. After an outreach program in Bataan, the participants in the tour decided to visit the nearby Tambanga waterfalls just a few minutes away from the school outreach venue. This was not part of the tour itinerary. Upon reaching the falls, the teachers leaped into the water in their street clothes and taunted the students to do the same. The students obliged and two died due to the strong undercurrent under or near the falls. Victims were grade eight students and one of whom is the grandson of former Congressman Jose Dodong Gulias. You will agree with me, Mr. Speaker, my dear colleagues, that in all these instances, the loss of lives is senseless. Senseless indeed. After the Madlum Cave incident, calls to abolish these educational activities are being pushed by some sectors. Mr. Speaker, yesterday I filed House Resolution Number 1397, urging the House Committee on Higher and Educational Technical Education under the able leadership of Congressman Roman T. Romulo to conduct an investigation in aid of legislation on the BSU Madlum Cave incident in the light of reviewing Chad Memorandum Order Number 17, Series of 2012, which contains the standing policies and guidelines on educational tours and field trips of college and graduate students. Mr. Speaker, my dear colleagues, as Chair of the Committee on Tourism and member of the Committee on Higher and Technical Education, I have two major concerns on the issue at hand. The first is the educational value of these activities. And second is the safety of the students. 
On the issue of relevance of these educational tours and field trips, I submit that learning should not be confined in the four corners of the classroom or the school campus, and that there is wisdom in providing venues of learning outside the school. It is in this light that the CHED issuance recognize educational tours and field trips duly required in the approved curriculum of authorized higher education programs of both public and private higher learning institutions. Objectives of these activities under the CHED memo are to provide access to efficient and interactive learning and provide quality educational tours and or field trips. Curriculum enhancement and broadening of students' learning opportunities in a field of the world, of the world are emphasized. Hence, it appears that these educational tours and field trips should already have been pre-approved by CHED upon approval of the school curriculum. This is bolstered by the fact that higher educational institutions under Section 16 of the CHED Memorandum are required to inform the CHED reg regional offices on the nature, purpose, schedule, destination, and costs, and at least one month before the opening of classes for every calendar year. I repeat, the CHED requirement is one month before the opening of classes and not one month before the scheduled activity. I agree with this that these kinds of learning activities should have already been integrated in the school curriculum in order to ensure its relevance in the whole school or degree program. Failure to include them as required by CHED should preclude them from conducting such activities within the academic year. Also, the issue of relevance necessarily includes costs, as it is sometimes the case that field trips cost more than the tuition fees of the students. The CHED memo also stated that there should be additional costs prior consultation must be had. More importantly, and as pointed out by CHED in recent news, these educational tours and field trips should not be made mandatory, nor as basis for grading, nor as condition for exemption in taking of examinations. The CHED memo also provides that students who cannot join the trip should be given parallel school activity. Again, in our Madlum Cave incident, news accounts quoted Donna Marcello, mother of one of the students who died, as saying that they allowed Helena to join the field trip because according to her daughter, the examinations would be harder if they don't join the field trip. Further, this incident, as well as in the Benguet incident, tourism students were the victims. While these field trips help local tourism, what is the value of these activities in the teaching of tourism? I submit that these activities should be properly justified as to their nature, relevance, and costs. On the second issue of security of the students, Chair Memorandum Circular Number 17 is very particular on this aspect. The Chair issuance is clear that security of the students should be the foremost responsibility of the higher education institutions concerned. Hence, the following provisions of the CHED memo. One, priority should be given to registered museums, cultural sites, and landmarks in line with the objectives of the educational tour or field trip. Second, submission of medical clearance 
by the students to show capability of students to undertake the activity. Third, advance and proper coordination with the local government units with appropriate clearance and memorandum agreement. Fourthly, engagement of tour operators and tour guides as well as travel and tour operators duly accredited by the Department of Tourism. Fifthly, briefing and debriefing program before and or after the activity. Briefing shall include precautionary measures and risk assessment procedures with the students together with their parents or guardians. Six, information to the Chad Regional Office's concern. And lastly, the prior consultation with parents and stakeholders be had. In fact, Mr. Speaker, my dear colleagues, the Chad Memorandum includes a three-page checklist for compliance by the higher education institution. Now the question is, have these guidelines been complied with by the Bulacan State University? As I have earlier mentioned, Madlum Cave is considered an extreme outdoor adventure. I would like to repeat, extreme outdoor adventure. How can three teachers possibly ensure the safety of the 180 minors who participated in the trek? Have there been prior coordination and briefing made? As additional recommendations, Mr. Speaker and my dear colleagues, I would like to submit the following for the consideration of the Committee on Higher and Technical Education. First, the certification by CHED as a prerequisite in the conduct of educational tour or field trip. Hence, a no CHED authority, no field trip policy. Second, non-allowance of the conduct of the school activity if not pre-approved or submitted one month before the start of the academic year. Thirdly, consideration of the roadworthiness of the vehicles to be used during the activity. Fourthly, consideration of weather conditions and if possible, no tours or trips on extremely rainy months. Fifthly, specification as to teacher to student ratio. Sixthly, presumption of regularity in the performance of official duties shall not be used as a defense. And lastly, Mr. Speaker, accountability of higher learning institutions should be raised. In conclusion, I hope that we have all learned our lessons. Extraordinary diligence is really required in these instances. And I implore, Mr. Speaker, my dear colleagues, on our role in ensuring that these will not happen again and never again. And so let us put an end to this senseless loss of lives and injuries to our children and our youth. Let us ensure that these educational tours and field trips are not only fun, but as well as substantive learning will be experienced by them. Thank you and good day to all. Thank you, Your Honor. The privilege hour has expired, Majority Leader. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but before that, I move that we refer the speech of the Honorable Relampagos to the Committee on Rules. Without objection, the motion to refer the speech of the Honorable Rene Relampago to the, commission, uh, to the Committee on Rules is approved. I move that we formal, formally terminate the privilege hour, Mr. Without Speaker. Without objection, the privilege hour is terminated. Uh, before we proceed, Mr. Speaker, uh, allow me to, to greet the guests of the Honorable Jeffrey Kongun. They are the Punong Barangays of the municipality of Zubik, Sambales. The guests of the Honorable Konghun, may we ask that they please rise. Pwede po ba kayong tumayo so that you'll be acknowledged by the House? Thank you, 
Majority leader. Mr. Speaker, likewise, we have here the guests of the Honorable Samuel Pagdilao Jr., Abigail Aricheta, Marilyn Lapitan, Regina Castellone, Concepcion del Valle, retired PMP Colonel Supronio Catapang, Bobby Cortez, and Limineo Misalucha. Will the guests of the Honorable Pagdilao please rise so that you'll be acknowledged? Mari po kayong tumayo. Maraming salamat po sa inyong pagbisita. Thank you very much. Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move that we resume consideration of uh, resolution of both houses number one and that the Secretary General be directed to read again the title of the resolution. Without objection, consideration of uh, the resolution of both houses number one is in order. The Secretary General is directed to read the title of said RBH1. Resolution of both houses number one. Resolution of both houses proposing amendments to certain economic provisions of the 1987 Constitution of the Republic of the Philippines, particularly on Articles 12, 14, and 16. Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move that for the, a sponsor, we recognize the gentleman from Cavite, the Honorable Elpidio Barsaga. The gentleman from Cavite, the Honorable Elpidio Barsaga, is recognized to continue sponsorship of RBH1. You have the floor, gentlemen. For the interpolation, Mr. Speaker, I move that you recognize the gentleman from Bayan Muna, the Honorable Neri Colmenares. And the Honorable Neri Colmenares is recognized for his interpolation. You have the floor, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before I start my interpolation, this is a clarificatory question, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I intend to interpolate uh, our colleague, Congressman Barzaga, with regards to his sponsorship speech. I also would like to interpolate uh, Congresswoman Milen with regards to her sponsorship speech. What is our procedure here? Do I ask all the questions with Congressman Barzaga or do I shift to Congresswoman Milen uh, with regards to her sponsorship speech, Mr. Speaker? The Chair declares a one-minute uh, suspension. Session resume. In reply to the query of the gentleman from Bayan Muna, the chair has been informed that it will be the Honorable Barsaga that will uh, respond to all the questions of the Honorable uh, Colmenares. And uh, he will be assisted by the Honorable uh, Garcia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So uh, all, the, uh, all the sponsorship speech uh, of the speeches of the distinguished sponsors uh, which we will refer to during the interpolations will be answered by both uh, expertly, I am sure, by Congressman Barsaga. Thank both you for that. Speeches, both his speeches, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank Please you. Please proceed. Yes. Um, magandang hapon, Congressman and Barsaga. I am very happy that uh, we meet again uh, during this period with regards a very, very important issue, which is charter change. So first slide lang. Uh, it seems from the resolution itself that the opinion of the authors, the sponsors, is that the restrictive provisions of the Constitution is causing the various economic problems that we are encountering today and that in fact it is clear. It says in the resolution Whereas, in order to realize the full benefit of inclusive growth, the restrictive provisions in the Philippine Constitution, which hampers flow of foreign capital investment, must be lifted. From this uh, provision, Mr. Speaker, let's just level off for a while. The intention of the sp sponsors, therefore, is that these restrictive provisions, which uh, Congresswoman Albano mentioned in her speech as bias in favor of the Filipinos should be liberalized so that uh, foreign capital, foreign investments will freely come into the country. Am I correct in that assumption, Mr. Speaker? That is a very correct assumption, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. In the sp sponsorship speech of, uh, well, this was actually by Congresswoman Milen, uh, Albano. It, she said, however, SWS economic indicators reveal, she was discussing the 
the growth, the GDP growth in the country, and the various growth uh, in the economy of the country, which President Aquino has actually hammered in his previous uh, State of the Nation addresses. There is a however in the growth report, and it says, according to the sponsors, however, SWS economic indicators reveal that despite the 7.2% GDP growth in the last quarter of 2013, the trends of poverty, hunger, and joblessness has been flat for several years. 12.5 million of our countrymen are jobless. May we ask, Mr. Speaker, what the distinguished sponsor think is the reason for this poverty, hunger, joblessness of our countrymen, despite the 7.2% growth which the Aquino government has frequently mentioned in their uh, public pronouncements, Mr. Speaker? Firstly, Mr. Speaker, we have to admit that the um, unemployment in our country is actually increasing. As a matter of fact, in the survey conducted from June 27 up to June 30, the employment rate among Filipinos at least 18 years of age is 25.7% or 11.5 million Filipinos, and in March 2014, 25.9 or 11.8 million individuals in June 2014. Of course, we must also admit that there has been an increase of 7% in our GDP. Unfortunately, the 7% increase would not be sufficient in order to provide employment to all our Filipinos. And how do we address the problem pertaining to employment? Necessarily, we must have more businesses, we must have more factories, and in the process, we must have more capital. Unfortunately, this much-needed capital cannot be sourced from local sources, and indeed, we have to have for indirect investment. In short, we have to create an atmosphere in the Philippines where foreign direct investment coming from foreign investors will be welcomed and their investments would be protected. We have the restrictive provisions under the Constitution. 60-40 allotted to Filipinos is 60% and 40% only to foreigners. Unfortunately, in as much as my interpreter happens to be a lawyer, he would fully agree with me that no foreign investor, as a rule, would invest only 40% in a business enterprise, considering that in so far as corporations are concerned, the rule of majority or at least 51% is necessary. And because of this constitutional prohibition in some cases, in order to circumvent the provision of the Constitution, there are, cer there are certain foreign investors which are using dummies, making it appear that Filipinos are the true owners of 60% of the corporation were in truth and in fact they are not. And it is for this reason that the advocates of charter change are really pursuing the change in the restrictive economic provisions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The distinguished sponsors are proposing opening up the economy to foreign investors, FDIs. We, in our part, believe now, this opening up of the economy will destroy and cripple the local economy. Our farmers who are producing agricultural products, our local businesses and industries. But it seems that the sponsors think otherwise, and I'm sure they've studied the economic implications of all these uh, proposals, Mr. Speaker. May I ask, therefore, then, 
GDP growth, ibig sabihin dumami ang ating produkto, what is the reason why employment did not pick up? In fact, unemployment increase. What was the reason for that, Mr. Speaker? Is there something that President Aquino was not telling us because he keeps on mentioning the fact that there is this GDP growth, but he doesn't state the fact that there is growing unemployment. And in fact, if we were to follow the sponsorship speech, poverty, hunger, and joblessness in the country, how can that be, Mr. Speaker, that there is a growth, but that growth did not include employing our poorest of the poor, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, I wish to emphasize that the charter change, the change embodied in our proposal, will be merely the inclusion of the praise unless provided by law. Meaning to say, the moment that these provisions would be approved, it does not automatically mean that we are opening our natural resources to foreigners or foreign investors. It, there must be a law to be implemented by Congress. In other words, we just want to have Congress a certain leeway, some sort of flexibility if in the future they think that it is necessary to open our natural resources and other businesses for foreigners. Secondly, assuming for the sake of argument that indeed the, the charter, change wa charter change was successful, and assuming further that Congress is already contemplating a law opening our natural resources or agricultural lands to our, to our foreign partners or to foreign investors. Based on the experience of our Asian neighbors, there were plenty of foreign direct investment when they allow ownership or participation majority.